afternoon and, and welcome to uh, Tech Launch's bullpen number 18. And um, uh, it's a beautiful day out there. And thank you very much for joining us. What I'd like to do is first start off with um, uh, brief introductions. Uh, my name is Mario Casabona, and I am the um, uh, a founder of Tech Launch. Uh, and then um, uh, I also want to introduce Robin Baer, who's a co-host, uh, and she'll be uh, um, uh, really taking over once I turn it over after a few slides. And then Eric is our webinar producer. Um, uh, and both of them, Robin Baer is a strategic advisor for startups and the middle market companies, as well as Eric is an entrepreneur, and both of them are senior mentors and advisors. So uh, in this slide, the mission slide, um, what I want to do is uh, point out, I'm going to read it um, because it's our mission. Uh, our overall mission is to commercialize emerging technology by finding and nurturing early stage tech ventures to accelerate growth via mentoring, coaching, networking, and access to resources and capital. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So how, uh, how do we fulfill our mission? Uh, well, we, we actually execute on a few programs. The first one is the um, uh, Tech Launch Business Accelerator, which uh, since its inception in 2012, when we created New Jersey's first tech accelerator, providing seed capital and mentoring through a 16 week accelerator program, we actually launched 26 new ventures with the help of over 150 mentors in our network. And then in 2017, uh, we pivoted Tech Launch for it to be a virtual business accelerator model, which has helped over 60 new ventures through mentoring and pitch events like this. Um, and, and then the other thing we did is uh, we created, started a startup bootcamp weekends um, program for aspiring entrepreneurs who are thinking about starting their own ventures or in some cases wanting to better understand what it takes to be a, an entrepreneur. And then finally, which is what we launched uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic and wanted to make sure that we stayed uh, in touch with our ecosystem, um, we, uh, uh, we created a weekly uh, free office hours program to provide mentoring and coaching. Uh, and all these activities and initiatives are really focused on growing New Jersey's entrepreneurial and startup ecosystem with homegrown successful entrepreneurs and investors. Next slide, please. So uh, we're, uh, uh, I'm pleased to, to uh, introduce or, or have them do a self-introduction to our uh, panel of entrepreneurs and investors. So what I'm gonna do, instead of me doing the introduction, I'm gonna ask our panelists to do a self-introduction, an elevator pitch, please keep it short, 30 seconds. Um, and um, so we'll start with Christine. So Christine, can you uh, tell us about yourself? Uh, hi, my name is Christine Caruso and I provide advisory services for startups uh, focused on social impact and innovation. I've been working with startups for more than 15 years, adding value, particularly in the areas of strategy and financial management. I've worked in both investor roles and operational roles. Uh, in investor roles uh, at Philadelphia-based Independence Capital Partners and Context Capital Partners and in impact investing uh, focused on innovation right here in New Jersey um, at the, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority and the New Jersey Health Foundation. I've worked with startup companies in various industries from life sciences to B2C focused businesses and I've worked with companies at various stages uh, from the ideation stage to um, later stage deals. So I bring a unique perspective uh, with my diverse experience and I'm excited to be participating in this bullpen event uh, and listening to the three presenting companies today. Great. Thank you, Christine. Jill? 
Hi, good afternoon. My name is Jill Johnson. It's great to be here with all of you. Uh, I'm the co-founder and the CEO of the Institute for Entrepreneurial Leadership. We're a not-for-profit organization that I co-founded with my father in 2002. And our mission is really around eradicating the barriers that exist uh, for people who uh, lack access to the knowledge networks and capital that are necessary for entrepreneurial success. I started my career at Goldman Sachs. I'm you know, about 30 years at this point um, uh, as a business strategist. I wrote business plans during the dot-com era, and um, I've worked with lots of entrepreneurs who are trying to uh, take their business to the next level, yet have uh, very limited resources. So really excited to be here. Great, Jill. Thank you very much. And Joanne? Hey, everyone. So my name is Joanne Lynn. I'm a principal at Newark Venture Partners right here in Newark, New Jersey. Um, our firm is a early stage venture capital fund with about 100 million in assets under management. We're focused on pre-seed through Series A investments. I focus on our direct investment arm. We also have a pre-seed arm focused on um, early stage opportunities where we use that as a, as a real funnel to to guide our direct investment opportunities as well. Um, I joined the firm in 2017, have about 15 years of finance experience, also starting on Wall Street, um, and for the past five years or so, been involved in private equity and venture capital. So I'm very excited to be here and excited to see what the presenters have to, uh, to show us today. Great, Joanne. Thank you. And Jay? I, I'm Jay Body here, speaking from the Bat Cave in my house, and uh, I'm a co-founder of a venture fund called Brand Project Capital. Uh, we invest in early stage uh, consumer companies, direct to consumer. So we have a pretty interesting portfolio with companies like Freshly, Daily Harvest, Pet Plate, Chef's Plate um, that we've invested in that you know have done you know exceptionally well over the last several years. Uh, before getting into venture, I was an entrepreneur. I had a startup in Silicon Valley called Spock.com, which was a search engine that powered most of the social networks back in the day. And, uh, you know, so I've been on both sides of the fence over here from both entrepreneurship as well as, you know, investing in founders and helping them scale their businesses. Great, Jay, thank you. And thank you to the, to you panelists. Um, and next slide, please. So uh, what, it, what I wanna do is briefly introduce our event uh, partners, if you would, um, and then um, uh, just briefly uh, introduce who they are. So Jumpstart, uh, New Jersey Angel Network. Um, they're the premier angel group in the mid-Atlantic region with over 35 members. And their typical investment range is from about 100 to about a million dollars. That's the uh, total check size as a, a group of investors. Uh, and then Tech Council Ventures, um, with over uh, $50 million under management, they invest in early stage technology companies in the mid-Atlantic region as well. Casabona Ventures, uh, which uh, I founded and run, uh, we have over 20, I'm sorry, over 30 tech companies uh, in, its, in our portfolio. We're basically an angel round firm, which invests in seed stage tech ventures, Initial investments range from 25 to about $100,000. Our focus is in med tech, digital health materials, and more broadly, more broadly on um, IoT. Uh, Gibbons Law uh, is a nationally recognized leader in, in corporate law uh, that regularly advises early stage uh, businesses that have over 200 attorneys. Uh, Gibbons is leading law firm in the East Coast and ranked one of the uh, nation's top 200 by the American lawyers. Witham, Witham Smith & Brown, also known as, is the 26th largest accounting firm, tax and consulting firm in the country, and it has had a group focused on startups and emerging growth sector for over uh, 20 years. And then finally, Gerhart Law is a fully serviced intellectual property law firm, um, supportive, very supportive of early stage ventures specializing in patents, trademarks, 
uh, copyrights um, um, and trade secrets. And, and the, uh, the, the six uh, partners are the ones that are providing either in-kind services or in the Jumpstart Angel Network and Tech Council Ventures, the winner gets the uh, opportunity to present at one of their meetings. So I think at this point, uh, next chart, uh, at this point, I'm going to introduce uh, Robin Baer, who's going to take the uh, program over from this point on. Thank you to everyone. Robin, it's Great. all your Great. Thanks. Thanks, Mario. Um, so well, first of all, welcome everyone uh, this afternoon to our 18th edition of Tech Launch's Bullpen Pitch Competition. Uh, I'm just going to review a little bit about how this event is going to work. Um, we've got three great companies that are pitching for you today. Um, each company is going to go through uh, three components. Their first uh, is a seven minute pitch presentation, followed by seven minutes of audience Q&A. So audience members, that's your opportunity, that's your chance to participate and engage with the founder who's, who's pitching. Uh, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can do that while they're pitching. You can put your questions in there. You don't need to wait till the end. And I will go through and do my best to pick up your questions from there and moderate those uh, in that seven minute period. After the audience Q&A, um, which warning can get lively sometimes. Uh, after that, we'll have seven minutes of direct questioning from our judging panel. Um, so that's where they will um, dive a little deeper into some of the questions um, to really determine who they think is most fundable. Um, the investor panel is looking to evaluate each team based on five main metrics, and I'll discuss those a little bit so you can see what, you're, um, what they are going to be thinking of as they're going through. Um, they're going to be looking at team, whether, this, uh, whether the management team that they have in place is going to be able to deliver or to execute on this concept or this idea, and whether that team has the requisite uh, expertise and talent in that industry to be able to, to um, make this happen. They're going to look at product. Um, um, whether there is, uh, to the extent that there is a minimally viable product available, they're going to be looking for any kinds of unique competitive advantages, um, any kinds of unique intellectual property uh, sur surrounding that, and what kind of traction the company has had to date. Uh, the judges are also going to look at market size and need. Um, what's the size of the total addressable market and um, you know, what kind of scope the company has, what plans they have in place uh, for that, and um, maybe even diving down a little bit into evaluating their, their business model, their revenue model, and some specifics about uh, revenue capture of that market share. They are also going to look at capital raise and use of funds. Um, they're going to look at what kind of investment has been made to date and how has that impacted the development of the company so far. And they're going to assess um, whether the uh, current ask, the current fundraising ask, um, aligns with the current milestones. And finally, they're going to be evaluating the presentation quality, um, how well the founder delivered the message, um, how articulate they were, and how well they answered the questions uh, in the audience and investor Q&A. And as Mario said, the winner of this uh, competition, determined to be most fundable, uh, gets the opportunity to move forward and to pitch to Jumpstart Angels and Tech Council Ventures. And with that, I think we can move to our first uh, competitor up uh, is TapArt. TapArt is an online marketplace that empowers digital artists globally to sell their designs in the form of wall art products. TapArt was mentored by Ratan Agarwal and is being presented today by Sri Masabatula. Sri, you're up. Hello, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today. I'm Sri, founder and CEO of TapArt. TapArt is an online marketplace empowering digital artists globally. Can I move on to the next slide, please? Uh, next again. So this is the problem TapArt aims to solve. We all know quality wall art from authentic artists tends to be expensive. 
Graphic artists are creating highly unique designs, but they're still going unnoticed. And artists want to focus on creating. They don't want to focus on marketing and fulfillment activities, and they just don't have a way to reach buyers. Next slide, please. So this is the solution TapArt provides. We curate artwork from talented digital artists globally and bring their designs onto our website as finished wall art products. All the artists have to do is share the designs with us. We do the heavy lifting for them. And because these art files are shared with us digitally, we have the ability to print this art on multiple formats, including canvases and frame prints. Next slide, please. So the online art market in 2018 was estimated to be $4.64 billion. And this includes everything from high end to auctions. So from that, we were able to estimate that TapArt's accessible market, which falls under the price range of TapArt's products, is worth $864 million. And from the Etsy quote you see below, art has seen increased demand over the pandemic as shoppers spend more time indoors and want to add some flair to their walls. Next slide, please. So our artists are our greatest influencers. On average, each of our artists have between eight to 12,000 followers on their social media accounts. This helps them drive traffic to our website organically. We partner with home decor bloggers and influencers. And in the past, this has given us our highest return on investments for advertising. We'd also be advertising on Google, Instagram, and Pinterest. We've already advertised on all three of these or three of these platforms before and measured for cost per clicks and conversion rates. And this is where we'd like to place our bets. Next slide, please. So here are a couple of artists who are currently listed with TapArt. Our artists are usually 25 to 34 years old and working a full-time job at a design agency to make ends meet. But being an artist, they're always creating new designs. With, by working with TapArt, they're essentially able to leverage their social media followers. And with TapArt's help that they get on the marketing and fulfillment side, we help artists generate a side income. Next slide, please. So here's our go-to-market ecosystem. Fairly simple, TapArt acting as an intermediary between the customers and the artists. TapArt's primary role is artist acquisition and, 15, and keeping our artists happy. And on the other end, we partner with third-party marketing firms to generate brand awareness and partner with fulfillment centers to ship and deliver orders. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so this is the closest competition to tap art. Artists don't want to be on generalized marketplaces where their designs are lost in a sea of other products. They want to be on specialized marketplaces where they've been vetted and recognized for the quality of their work. Tap art distinguishes itself because of its artist's emphasis and communicating the story behind the artist and the artwork. Next slide, please. So we give our users the ability to really connect with the artist through lengthy product description and building immersive experiences with our artists. Our brand is all about supporting and representing our artists. We've got some cutting edge technology in the works. We're currently working on an AR feature which develops 3D models and lets our users see the artwork on the wall before they give us a single penny. Our tap art app is also in the works where we're developing an app which can essentially scan high resolution artworks. And this would help artists in developing countries sell their work. Next slide, please. So our business model, fairly simple. Suppose someone, uh, suppose a customer buys a $300 canvas, 15% of the 300 goes to the artist, 30% of the 300 goes towards manufacturing cost. We keep the rest. Next, next slide, please. So here are my favorite testimonials because they talk about the distinct advantages TapArt provides. Testimonial one, we give artists an opportunity, young, talented designers. Number two, we're affordable. And number three, we don't sell canvases or frame prints. We sell stories behind the artist and the artwork. Next. So this is our team. Um, myself, Shri, uh, I'm a marketing and analysis experience. Yo is an MFA from Pratt Institute. His work has been featured on Christie's and Sotheby's. Eddie is our social media guy. At one point, he was one of Puerto Rico's biggest music video producers. Utsa, I've known her personally for over seven years now. We went to college together and she is our artist manager. And with our advisors, we wouldn't be here today 
Alex Kemzies. He's a VP in financial services at a firm on Wall Street. He brings in a lot of merger and acquisition experience, and he has been crucial in helping us with financial projections and market research. And then we have Mr. Ratan Agarwal. He's the co-founder and managing partner of Carbon Group, and he has been crucial to us with strategy and ideation. Next slide, please. So these are some of the numbers. As an e-commerce brand, these are some of the metrics we're regularly tracking. And these are in trend with what we've been seeing in the industry. Average order value is 165, and our average return on ad spend across the industry is 4.5x. And by return on ad spend, I mean the return on investment on the advertising campaigns. So as long as we do hit 4.5x, our projected revenue in 2023 should be 2.7 million. Next slide, please. So this is our five-year roadmap. As long as we get the funding we need, these are the goals we expect to hit. As you can see, upon maturity, our revenue would be 7.31 million. And considering EBITDA for e-commerce businesses is 10x, we are expecting to give our investors anywhere between a 15x return on their investment in five years. Next slide, please. So 70% of the money that we raise will be used to generate new business. We've already vetted marketing companies and we'll be going through them to handle our advertising campaigns on social media. The other end of the other big chunk of the money goes towards bringing in our new artists. We've seen that sales are directly proportional to the number of art pieces that we offer for sale. So that will be our second biggest priority. Next slide, please. So summing up, I've personally brought in all the money so far, and I own 100% of the business so far. Uh, we've bootstrapped heavily up until this point, and at this stage, I believe that we have enough data and market validation to go execute in the market. We believe that with the 350K investment, we will be able to achieve our growth goals and provide a sizable return to our investors. If this is the kind of business you want to help grow and invest in, do reach out to me at free at the tapheart.com. Thank you for your time and patience. And I look forward to answering your questions. Great, thank you, Shri. Uh, so for the audience, um, I'd like you to put your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, now is the time to uh, drop those questions in there. Um, but to start off, um, Shri, I want to ask you a little bit about um, copyright issues. Have you discussed that or how are you addressing any kind of um, legal rights to the art and, and how does your platform address that? Yeah. So at the moment, we are we give our artists a royalty free assignable non-exclusive license and this is the same copyright license that a red bubble or a society six uses with its artists we are working on creating limited edition artworks in the future so we will be devising a copyright process there to protect our uh, protect tap art and our artists Okay, great. Um, and how did you arrive at the 15% commission to the artist? So starting off, we looked at a lot of different marketplaces and how they were paying their artists. Um, and looking at Society6 and Red Bubbles as models, they were really huge marketplaces with a, different, with a bunch of products. So the industry average was about 17.5. And we told our artists that, hey, if we do 15%, is it okay? And the artists seemed okay with it because this is just the start for us. And I'm sure as, as we grow, we'll be providing more opportunities to our artists. Okay, great. And how do you compare, since you mentioned uh, Society6, you mentioned Redbubble, um, which are already in existence, and those are platforms that are already up. Um, how do you compare to them um, in terms of the market share that you hope to get? So, the main difference between a red bubble and a society six and tap heart is that there are just a way more products on those bigger marketplaces and artists can essentially sell their design on a yoga mat or a shower curtain and that way there is no respect that the artist is getting so by working with tap heart and as i mentioned in my presentation artists want to be a part of specialized marketplaces where they're actually recognized for their work and because of our artist emphasis we are, and wall art centric, being wall art centric, we're able to stand out in the crowd. Okay, great. 
Um, and we have some questions here. Um, what kind of traction have you seen so far? Um, so do you have any metrics on um, sales through the site or artists on uh, artists that are participating that are uploaded? So we have 24 artists listed on the website currently. We around 10 of them are in the funnel and they should be releasing together in the next month. So, and in terms of sales traction, we've generated almost $18,000 revenue. And personally, I've just invested as much as I could on the advertising campaigns, just to understand what's the cost per clicks, where are the conversion rates for each social media platform. So using those metrics and from talking to other industry leaders and players, we were able to use those experience to provide our estimates. Okay. Okay, great. Um, I am going to circle back because we seem to have a lot of questions that are focusing on the um, the commission, the 15% commission rate. Um, the reaction um, that we're getting from the audience is that that seems really low and could potentially launch a bidding war among other platforms. Um, is it something that you've considered about um, starting at 15% or, or reevaluating that figure? So we, yeah, I get this question often. And the reason we're doing 15% right now is because we're building out too. And when you're a digital artist, it's not that you're working on one piece for 50 hours and 60 hours, and it can never be recreated because it's a digital file. We can print out these designs multiple times on different formats like art prints or canvases. So instead of just making money on the one piece you sell, we're helping you, we're giving you a small cart of a lot of different sales that are happening through your designs. So because we're reproducing these designs, artists ultimately do end up making more because 20 people can buy this same design. Okay, great. Um, we have a question, what kind of fabrics do you use to print your artwork on and what is your print manufacturing process like? So uh, we, we're doing art prints, frame prints and canvas right now. And yeah, all of, all of these are yeah, manufactured in New Jersey or North Carolina. So right now, uh, yeah, we're using eco-friendly materials to produce it and the raw material comes from China. It's shipped and assembled out of North Carolina or New Jersey, and then ship directly to the customer. Okay, okay. Um, and how are artists marketing their work now? Um, if they're already using social media now to communicate with their followers and, and, and reach their audience, um, how does your platform uh, give them any, any additional leverage or, or help them yeah. in that way? So most of the artists, uh, they, they're creating new designs and they're putting out new content, but then the way they increase their social media following is by being featured on other graphic design collectives or marketplaces. So really the thing is these artists, they want to be focused on just creating artwork. They don't want to be focused on marketing and fulfillment and customer service. They think that that is just taking time out of their schedule on the unimportant stuff. So by working with TapArt, they're essentially able to single-mindedly focus on creating artwork while letting us do the tough stuff. Okay, uh, we have uh, maybe time for two more questions. Um, what are the barriers to entry for your competitors? Um, you know, what's, what's preventing a competitor from stepping into this space that you've defined for yourself? So uh, people ask me this question and also they, like, they usually say, what's your IP? My answer is always our artists are our biggest IP. Right now we're young. We have a few artists to start with. We're just starting off. But over time we'll be once we sign special artists, we'll be launching limited edition prints. And then, you know, we'd have the best artists uh, in the marketplace. So it makes it hard to compete with us. Okay, and last question, um, from what countries do you source the artists? And um, re related to that, how do you reach out to identify artists, maybe from um, non-traditional uh, areas of the world or developing countries? 
Yeah, so our artists are everywhere. Right now, as I said, we have 24 artists and those 24 artists are in different countries, mostly people from Thailand, India, UK, Australia, Vietnam. These are the countries most of the artists come from. And for them, even if they're making five sales in a month, and then they're getting the 15%, but those add up, they're making $100 in a month for them when it translates to uh, Australian. Australia, it's not much of a conversion difference, but it converting in a place like India, it's, a, it's major money. Okay, great. Thank you very much. That was our seven minutes, our, our time is up. So Shri, thank you very much for uh, answering those questions. Audience members, thank you for supplying those questions. And now we are going to turn to our investor panel, uh, the panel of judges, um, for their questions. And we are going to start with uh, Christine. Um, question for you, uh, is the platform fully built out? Um, the user platform, is there any additional work that needs to be done with respect to that? Uh, the platform's already built up. The website is thetapart.com. And yeah, we create artist profiles. Everything is already set up. And with respect to your advertising campaigns, um, from a historical perspective, have you been able to tell what the ROI is on those campaigns? And um, what level of confidence do you have uh, with respect to this fundraise that you'll be able to deliver the, the sales that you're projecting? Yeah. So... We've, we've been speaking to multiple players in the industry um, and we've noticed that three or four of them, they have 4.5x return on ad spend. And typically it's between four to four x in the art world. So that's what we're basing our projections out of. And me being working in marketing, uh, I know that there are some campaigns that I tested out with and they generated a 6x return on investment. So there are some campaigns which can generate 7x. There are some campaigns that can generate 3x, 3.5x. But then, yeah, we're making reasonable estimates and we're saying 4.5x. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Next up, we have Jay. Do you have questions for Shri? Yeah, a couple of uh, questions and a couple of observations over here. One, when I think, you know, obviously you were limited by time, but I think when you were going through the deck, you were going a little bit fast. So I think, you know, if you're pitching another investment round, just go a little bit slower to get the audience enough time to absorb some of the data in the slides over there. I agree 100% that the royalty is too low. When, when you're starting out in a startup, especially one that has competitive sets already against you, you want to make an offer that's so compelling that everyone wants to join you, right? Like that's one of the things I've learned building direct consumer businesses is that if your offer is in three, four, five X better than anyone else, you don't get a lot of traction over here. Um, and you're right about there. He's a graphic artist. These are not, they're not doing canvas prints and stuff like that. There's a, it's a different ecosystem. But if you say like in the beginning, Hey, I'm giving 30% royalties, get a lot of the marketplace built over there. That gets people excited. Um, the other thing I found is, you know, I went to tapart.com. You don't own that. You should definitely work really hard to buy that domain. Uh, I don't know if you're in the process of doing that or not. So, yeah, we've tried really hard to get it and it's available on cedo.com. But then, yeah, the person who owns that, yeah, if he's just not responding. But yeah, we're, we've been trying it. Yeah, so I think, I mean, I like the name. I think the tap art, it, it's okay. But like, you need to have tap art. Like, this is a brand play. I think one of the other things is in the deck you talked about is, um, you know, like the AI you want to put in there or like the, you know, virtual, you know, this is not, I think in the beginning, focus less on that and focus on building the marketplace up. So get really good graph uh, artists on the platform. And then the other side will build itself over here. And I've seen a lot of startups fail where they forget their core product is they're selling art, for example, or they're selling X, but they're trying to build tech because they think tech is cool or tech will get them a valuation and they fail. And so I think, you know, if you guys focus on, hey, we are selling art, how do we get the best artist doing the best art with us? You know, if you focus on that problem first and really go after that, you could build all the other things later down the road over there. Um, so I think that's interesting there. The other question is who buys you? Like, you know, like the, I'm trying to think of like outside of an eBay marketplace or an Etsy type of marketplace purchase, who buys you guys? So mostly it's the 25 to 34 year old market. That's where... No. I'm, I'm talking about like who buys your company when you went to, went to exit. If you're looking for an investment, 
there has to be a liquidity event down the road. Definitely. I suspect something like a Saatchi art would go for us. They have a really big online presence and I feel like we're just getting started with, you know, the, the age of graphic design. So a big player in the online art market who's looking to get into the digital side of things, I would see them, I see them buying tap art, acquiring tap art. Yeah. The other thing is, I think your revenue number, like for 2023 was kind of low from like a venture standpoint. So like as a venture investor, I look at that and, you know, it's a good, it's a good, I mean, it's a great number as a business. If you're doing this, Hey, I own hundred percent of this business and I'm looking for some small investors to come in with me and do this. That's interesting. That makes sense. But if you're looking at this as a, you know, I want to raise venture capital dollars from, you know, VCs down the road, they might just say the market's too small for them to get interested because the exit will be not big enough for them. Right. So I think you want to really think through like, you know, a lot of our best performing companies, um, were ones that grew 10 X almost every year. Like they went from a hundred thousand to a million to 10 million to a hundred million in revenue. And then to like, you know, two, 300 million, then they started doubling growth after hitting a hundred million. So I think, you know, if you're looking and it, it, there's no right or wrong answer here, like there's a lot of ways to build a great business, but if you're looking for venture dollars down the road or like having an institutional investor come in, you'll have to think about like, how do you scale the business a lot more, you know, rapidly on that over there. Definitely. Jay, those are, those are great comments, Jay. Thank you very much. Um, next up, we have Jill with your comments for Shri. Hi, thanks, Shri. Great presentation. Um, I think it's a really interesting concept. Um, one of the things that I wonder about, though, is the, um, the core value proposition and uh, the, the audience that you're targeting. Um, Art, a lot of art is based on scarcity, right? Uh, you know, people having authentic art and they're, they're being limited runs of it. The fact that not everybody can actually get it and you walk into someone else's home and see the same exact thing. Um, and it seems like what you're really focused on is the mass production of this art. Is there a happy medium? Is there a way that you can preserve this uh, large target audience and have a, a large addressable market but at the same time, create um, a sense of, of scarcity. So, <laughs> very interesting point, Jill. Uh, thank you for bringing this up, Ash. And we've, we've spoken to multiple players in the industry, and we were bringing up this concept of scarcity by restricting each design to only being reproduced 50 or 75 times. But then as we were speaking to other players in the industry, they were saying, Hey, in the art world, sales are directly proportional to the number of units you have, number of artworks listed on your website. Mm -hmm. So we're still trying to find the right balance there because we have certain costs to acquire artists too and acquire these designs too. So we're still trying to work out, you know, what's the best balance there. But then whether we come to a conclusion on this or not, we're definitely working on creating a limited edition series where artworks are restricted, you know, we have all the copyright laws, and then yeah, those would give more cut, more royalties towards the artists as well. And then just really quickly, um, is there a market for people who, let's say, want to upload their children's artwork and want to send that, you know, have uh, have that on their walls and send it to grandma and grandpa and aunts and uncles, and you know, send it out for holiday gifts or things like that. So, yeah, we were looking at that in the start, but then, yeah, for us, we are, we work with third party fulfillment centers. So yeah, our margins, there are very bleak and yeah, we just didn't want to get into it. Okay, great. Thank you, Jill, for your comments. Uh, next and finally, uh, we have Joanne, your comments for Shri. Thanks, Shri, for the presentation. Um, yeah, I, I want to echo some of um, what Jay mentioned in terms of priorities at the really early stage. Um, in particular, thinking about your your use of fun slide um, and you know, a good chunk of it being advertising. And I think most of that was probably advertising for, for customer base, which is the buyer. Um, but I think as you're building out a brand, and again, one that's so focused on the artists themselves, uh, you should spend a good chunk of your time also thinking about the the artists, art artists recruiting and art curation. So, can you talk a little bit about what that process looks like now? So, yeah, most of our artists they come from you know developing countries, as I mentioned, Thailand, Vietnam, um, Australia, 
India. There's where they come from. And we create their artwork by seeing them on Gribbon, Behance, Instagram, Pinterest. If you find good art, we reach out to them and say, hey, do you want to work with Tap Art? And we'll help supplement your income. And usually the answer is yes. But yeah, as Jay said, yeah, we do need to scale up on the artists. And we've given a lot of thought to this. And organically, if you, we try growing it without you know, putting in a lot of money towards advertising, our best shot would be at just scaling up the number of artists and help let the artists drive traffic to the website instead of us paying for the marketing. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's definitely worth exploring. And um, going through your website, you know, you you also mentioned having a big focus on highlighting the artists themselves and their stories. Um, how are you you doing that exactly? Because it, you know, if you go through the the menu options, um, you're not necessarily uh, organizing the website by artist, and and at most maybe there's a few sentences on the artist themselves at the top of their page. So how else are you also highlighting the artist and their story? Because I do think that that is a compelling value proposition, particularly if you're recruiting artists um, from developing nations, and and that being part of your core value proposition. Um, do you have plans to highlight that more? Because I don't think that that is, uh, you know, a very emphasized aspect when you go onto the website itself. Definitely. So, again, uh, right now we're doing this artist emphasis by creating lengthy, detailed product descriptions where you get to know the story behind the artist and the artwork. But what's in the works is we're working on short audio clips where the artist himself narrates how he created that design. So that would go into our product pages. That's one feature we're working on. And another one is a podcast that we're working on where I get to interview all of these digital artists and then artists share it with their uh, network, their social media followers, and in turn, they're also able to generate traffic. So we want, it's not being done to the full potential yet, but yes, since that is our main value proposition, we'll be picking it up right, rapidly. Great. Shri, thank you so much for answering those questions. Um, in, investors and judges, thank you for, uh, for asking those questions. Uh, now is the time we are going to, um, investors, you can, uh, or I'm sorry, panelists, um, please fill out your scorecard for tap art. We will give you about 90 seconds <laughs> to do that. Um, for the rest of us, um, Take a look at the slide. These are just some of the senior mentors who have given of their time and energy to work with a lot of these startup companies. Um, what you see today are three companies that have made made it through a screening round. Um, what the senior mentors do, we read a lot of applications. Um, we go through, we, we screen candidates, we talk to them. Uh, they go through multiple rounds of discussions before we eventually decide on three to uh, compete head to head to head. Um, and so we wanna thank these senior mentors for giving of their time to do that. Um, I think these are just a few of them that are up here. Um, there's quite a few others that are on the Tech Launch website. Um, so if we were in person, we'd all give you a big hand, but um, so virtual applause. <laughs> and Eric, if you could just let me know when the scorecards are all in, um, then we will uh, get ready to move on with the next um, um, the next presentation. Okay, just waiting for two more. Okay, great. Thank you. And also, I just want to take a minute to acknowledge the audience. Those were some great questions that you put in there. Um, so keep them coming um, as you're looking at these next, next two presentations. Um, start to put those in there early. Uh, obviously, I can't get to all of the questions, but um, the ones who tend to come in early get read first. So uh, jump in as soon as you have a question. Put that in the uh, Q&A so I can take a look.
Okay, Robin. Okay. I'll advance this slide. Okay, great. Thank you, Eric. Uh, so next up, we have Calamu. Calamu fragments data files, encrypts and scatters them across multiple public clouds using a patented process in a way that makes the data 100% breach proof, immune to ransomware and compliant. Its enterprise solution works seamlessly with most major cloud providers. Calamu was mentored this round by Peter Kestenbaum and today it's being presented by Paul Lewis, founder and CEO. Paul. Thanks Robin. My name is Paul Lewis, and I am the CEO and founder of Calamu. Calamu protects data in a completely new and innovative way. Using our patented process, data files are encrypted, fragmented, and scattered across multiple public clouds in a way that makes the data 100% breach-proof, resilient, and automatically compliant. Next slide, please. We all know the problem with data. We have massive data breaches, costly ransomware attacks, and compliance headaches. The cyber world is a mess. Next slide, please. I am going to quickly explain what we do, where we are now, and where we are going. Next. Calamu's patented process makes data breach-proof, resilient, and compliant. We encrypt, fragment, and scatter data across multiple public clouds. While the data is at rest, it cannot be hacked. It is completely breach-proof. If an attack were to occur, the hacker gets only useless fragments and no actual data. The data is resilient and immune to a ransomware attack. We don't try to prevent a ransomware attack. We just don't care if one happens. If an attack were to occur, the data simply self-heals. And the data is automatically compliant with data privacy regulations such as GDPR. The data is easily reconstituted to its native format when it is needed. Our solution is built, tested, and installed. Next slide, please. For the past 12 months, we have been in stealth mode securing our IP and developing our technology. I invested $500,000 and I quit my day job as an executive in a large cybersecurity company. We have two issued patents and several others that are pending. Our MVP is complete, and in mid-August, we started deploying enterprise pilots. One is installed, nine are in pro the process of being deployed, and others in initial discussions. We are up and running in a prestigious New York law firm and executing very well. A global pharmaceutical firm, it's a household name that's working on COVID, is moving forward with a paid pilot. We are under mutual NDA as of early September. Two global healthcare services companies have agreed to a pilot. Three financial institutions, including one global bank, have all agreed to a pilot and we are currently negotiating terms. Yesterday, one of the yesterday, literally just yesterday, uh, one of the three global credit card networks invited us to demo our product. They liked what they saw and we are now in discussions for a proof of concept. Not one company that we have confidentially approached has declined an executive level meeting. And just last week, a well-known technology and called Calamu very promising and game-changing. They are including Calamu in their next state of cyber report due out in December. The enterprise-grade product is built and fully integrated with Amazon AWS, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, and Dropbox for Business. Next slide, please. We are seeking an investment of $800,000 and prefer a convertible note or a safe. We're in active discussions with West Coast tech entrepreneurs, some names you may know. We will use the funds to refine our revenue model, our go-to-market strategy, and really nail customer preference. We will complete our initial pilots and complete our API integration with Office 365 and our enterprise API. We anticipate 2021 revenue of just over $1 million with five enterprise clients, growing to over 400 clients and just under 100 employees over the next five years. Next. <clears throat> we expect to become profitable in year three and grow to $100 million in revenue by the end of year five. I have no interest in building another 10 to $15 million company. I am swinging for the fences with this one. Next slide, please. Calamu has an extremely experienced core team of people I have known and worked with for over 10 years. We have all the disciplines required, 
uh, covered. And by the way, no one is taking a salary. I personally was the founder of two other technology companies that I successfully exited to the Fortune 500. Next. It's a gigantic market. We are initially focused on financial services because we have strong relationships there and also because they're under regulatory requirement to retain and protect data. We will also target healthcare, consumer lending, and legal because they share the same data concerns and have the same regulatory requirements to protect sensitive data. For go-to-market, we are focused on direct sales but have a partner model ready to roll as we scale. Next, please. I know the competition like the back of my hand. While others are working to protect data, only Calamoo makes data breach-proof, resilient, and compliant. Next. We are looking at several interesting strategic relationships and potential exit strategies to global tech companies. Next, please. I would enjoy a follow-up discussion on the items in our appendix, including our product details and a live demonstration of our technology at work. No smoke and mirrors, but the real deal. Our product roadmap, we have lots of big plans to make data safe. Our competitor details and a comparative analysis of billion dollar plus comparable companies and our recurring pricing model, license sales and resale thoughts. Next, Calamoo, breach proof, resilient, compliant data. Thank you. Great, thank you, Paul. Okay, so um, looking at the comments that are in the Q&A, um, we have quite a few comments um, about your claim that the um, data is 100% breach proof. So could you um, dive into that, expand on that thought a little bit and how is it fully 100% breach proof? Okay, so great question. And I've spent my entire career in information security and uh, have a great team around me. We've worked very hard to make the claim breach proof. We don't wanna be breach resistant like everybody else. We believe that we've come up with a solution where the data is completely breach proof. And that is because once the data is processed with Calamoo, it doesn't exist anywhere in the world. I know that sounds ludicrous, but that is actually the truth. We disperse the data amongst multiple public clouds and we replace the native data that would be on-prem with a proprietary file that has no user generated content. So while the data is at rest, it is completely breach proof. Okay, great. Um, we have a question, how do you integrate with clients existing systems or is there any particular type of system? I know you mentioned uh, some of the office, uh, the office platform, but um, are you targeting certain platforms for integration and how exactly do you do, you do that? Yep, so another great question. So we are. So today we are, are just an archival solution. We allow files to be processed through Calamoo out to the public clouds and then the data at rest is breach proof. Um, we're working on an integration with Office 365. So we would be completely compatible with Office 365. When you save your file, it would go out to Calamoo. We're also in discussions with several industry leaders with pr proprietary online applications where we're writing an enterprise API where we will be an interface between the application and the storage of that application. So rather than saving it to AWS, you're saving it through the Calamoo process to multiple locations. That will allow us to become transactional uh, and we're working on that right now. That's roadmapped. Okay, um, and I think that perhaps goes in with another question we have here, which um, is, is this services just, uh, is the Calamoo platform just for files or is it also databases? So today it's for files, folders, and volumes. So we can, we can process an entire volume or an entire drive. We're working very diligently on active transactional data in databases. And we have roadmapped and some, some uh, IP in that area that is really cool, I think is, is really revolutionary uh, in how we take records from a database and we Calamoo the entire database and we recall only the records that are needed uh, back to the system that's requesting them. So the rest of the database remains completely breach proof while that record is being acted on. 
And you mentioned that that's part of your future roadmap. That's something you're working on. We're current. We have that currently roadmap. We're working on that now. The development of that now. Okay. Okay. Um, can you go a little bit more into your IP? Um, how solid are the patents and IP? I think you said that these were patents that were granted. So maybe um, give a little information about when that was issued, um, and um, a, a little more background about the the patents. Okay. Yeah. So we are working with Gearheart Law. They're our they're our IP uh, firm, and uh, I've been working with David Polsalski over there for a number of years. The first patent was issued in 2017. Uh, that's our base patent. We have a nush, an additional patent that was issued in 20, 2018, the end of 2018, I believe. Uh, and we've got a bunch of others that are pending, including PCT patents. As, as we are expanding um, our realm, we're filing additional IP uh, and additional patents in those spaces. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we have a question. Why are you looking for early stage angel funding rather than uh, VC funding since your target is so large? Yeah, so another great question. So I, as I said in the, the presentation, I put $500,000 of my own money in and I can carry this only so far. Uh, I am out now trying to have the pilots installed because that's going to do wonders for my valuation. So I will go for Series A. I will need to go for a Series A. It's going to take a lot more money to get this launched than $800,000. But the $800,000 is to get us with to paid pilots, successful paid pilots, and hit those milestones, and then rapidly go after uh, Series A at a much higher valuation. OK. Great. Uh, let's see. Um, so we have some questions about blockchain. Um, will, uh, is, is this similar to a blockchain platform? And um, will a blockchain type solution compete effectively? Um, so the, the general answer is no. So blockchain is a very different technology. I think the end result in trying to uh, protect data is common. We're both doing the same things. But instead of having this open ledger system and, you know, the way blockchain is set up, um, we are using the public clouds. So we're harnessing the power of these incredible infrastructures built by Amazon and Google and Microsoft and Oracle and Alibaba uh, to, and we just process the data in a way that makes the data not exist in whole in any of those clouds. So no cloud provider has all the data, which makes it breach proof. So it's very different than blockchain. I, whoever's asking the question, I'd be happy to have a as long of a discussion as you'd like on that, but uh, that's a complicated question. We're different. Okay, so the nutshell answer is no, it, we're different. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think there's a follow-up question here to that. How does Calamu back up the keys so that with all the encryption, users are guaranteed continued, continued full access? Um, so okay. if you want to you know, yeah. address the key issue in, in blockchain. Yep, so, uh, not in blockchain, but in Calamu. So the keys, so we have a, a, an extensive key management solution where Calamu has zero knowledge of the keys that are being used. Only the organization, uh, the enterprise would have knowledge of those keys. Um, and it's, a, it's an extensive way that we manage that. We don't store the keys and the keys aren't stored locally. So the keys are actually stored in a different place, um, but I can, it's, it's trade secret, but I'm happy to have a follow on conversation uh, and engage our CTO. Uh, if someone's interested in really drilling down into that. Okay, uh, we have time for one final question. Um, uh, can you, uh, who, who really designed the technology? Um, you know, you said, you mentioned you have a team, but who actually holds the patents on this? Is that, um, uh, do you, is, it, is it with the company, um, key okay. members and, and others? Yeah. So the patents, so I'm the, I'm the author on the patents. I'm listed as the only inventor on the patents. I've, I've collaborated with, uh, with folks in my network, but I'm the, author, I'm the inventor and the patents are exclusively licensed to Calamo. Okay, great. Great, thank you. Um, thank you to the audience. You guys certainly kept me busy trying to read and talk at the same time. So I appreciate your patience. If I did not get to your question, I'm sorry, um, but uh, keep them coming. That was, that was great. 
um, investor panel and the judging panel. Um, we're now going to have seven minutes to cycle through um, yours. So please, investors, um, kind of pick about two questions that you want to really uh, ask of Paul, and um, we will go through that. Um, let's see. First up for Calamu, we will have Jill. Your questions for Paul. Terrific, thanks. Great presentation. This is really interesting technology. Uh, so my questions are around sales. Um, what's the lifetime value of each customer? How long is the sales process? And can you just talk a little bit high level about your sales approach uh, to cover this, you know, to cover so much ground? Yeah, so great question. So we're focused on the enterprise because that's where we wanted to end up and we decided to start there. Uh, and we've had such good response to the enterprise, we feel like we don't have to pivot to the SMB market, but we have a whole plan and a whole strategy to do that. Um, the sales cycle to the enterprise is going to be a pilot, and it's going to be a three to six month or longer term to go through a pilot to meet the milestones. Um, because we don't want to just waste our time and waste their time, we're only doing paid pilots. We've, we've phased out our free pilots, so we're only doing paid pilots to make sure that they have skin in the game. Um, and, and, and it's, a, you know, it's a lengthy process. The sales though are very high. So in selling a product like this into the enterprise, we're displacing things like encryption technologies, archival technologies, we're making them unnecessary. And some compliance tools we're actually making unnecessary. So the cost savings uh, in, in some of the institutions that we've spoken to would be somewhere in the order of $500,000 per month or more is what Calamu would save. In our model, we're using a $30,000 a month uh, subscription fee to the enterprise. And so what do you think the lifetime value of each customer is? We think the lifetime value is very long because this is a solution to our first gen is to store regulated data. So if you look at a seven year retention requirement, we're going to block data away for seven years. We think we're locked in for at least a seven year contract at that point. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Jill. Um, next up, Joanne. Thanks. Um, so, you know, I I know there's there's trade secrets and patented information here, but I feel like I um, don't have a great sense of how you, you talked about the competitive market a little bit. Um, who do you think is your closest competitor? Um, in the market now, and how do you compare your products? Uh, what are the, the clear differentiators? So there's, there's, there's competition for sure, right? There are a lot of companies that are trying to secure data and protect data and try to make that data breach proof. And if you go to one of the, the large conferences like the RSA security conference out in San Francisco every year, there's 3000 companies that are basically selling the same 10 things. Calamu is taking a completely different approach. We don't we're not layering on additional security. We're not you know, putting belts and suspenders on everything. We actually believe we could store data in the public domain in a way that makes it only accessible by the owner of that data. Um, and just to really very quickly touch on, on the process, imagine if you took your American Express card and you put it in a blender and then you put, you know, you hid parts of it outside and parts of it in your house and parts of it in the park. Only know the parts of only get that and reassemble it back. So while other companies are, are using airlocks and triple quadruple encryption and stronger encryption, um, that's not going to prevent against the next wave of attacks when we get to higher computing levels. We believe that we're a much more long-term solution for uh, thwarting off a data breach. So, so no other competitors are using any form of distributed cloud encryption. Yeah. Oh, others are but it's done in, in very different ways. Like for example, eraser coding, we're using the fragmentation process. Um, one company, Cleversafe, uh, has a, sharding, a data sharding technology. Uh, they were recently required, uh, acquired a couple of years ago by IBM. I think it was 1.3 billion. Uh, but there are other companies that are sharding and fragmenting data. We're doing it in a very unique way. Okay. Um, and how, in terms of the capital that you're raising now, um, what, what additional development work needs to happen on the product and, and what is, um, you know, where is that going to be able to get the product to in terms of, you know, enterprise ready um, status? 
So the, the Gen 1 is enterprise ready today. The product is complete. That's already been funded and developed and complete and installed. And that's what we're using to pilot. But that's focused on data at rest. Really where I'm driving now too and where my vision is, is transactional data. So the earlier question about database, I mean, that's, that's where we're driving to. Um, so there's a lot of evolution that we have on our roadmap and a lot of other, we have tons of ideas and, and uh, it's trying to keep focus on those ideas uh, and execute, fund them and execute in a, in a very strategic and specific way. And a really quick follow-up question there. Do your, your current kind of pilot customers or um, customers that you're, you're planning to launch your pilots with, have they, um, do they have a solution, a similar solution for their, um, the data that's in transit? And do they, is that a platform that you're also competing with? So, so I, you know, I just want to state that Calamoo, the data is encrypted in transit. So we never, we never have anything that's not encrypted. It's encrypted on prem and processed on prem and then pushed out to the public clouds. Um, but other companies are using encryption methodologies that are cumbersome and complex and a lot of times user driven. We're completely eliminating it. So our API and the vision that I have for our API is we'll plug into an enterprise application and be a layer between that application and the storage. It's invisible to the user. So the user, they go home one night working one way and they come in the next morning working a different way and now their data is secure. Okay, great, thank you. Great, thank you, Joanne. Um, next, Christine, do you have questions for Paul? Yeah, um, first of all, great presentation. This is a really interesting space and definitely a, a, a problem that needs to be solved. Um, I like that you have patents and that you're using some pilot projects to, to fund some further uh, uh, development. Um, I like the industries that you're focusing on initially. Um, one question is, you know, is there an application in the defense industry with respect to this? Um, uh, one question I have is with respect to processing speed. So uh, um, can you speak to what kind of an effect this has? Uh, like, does it increase the costs of your customers? Um, because they may require additional hardware to to um, uh, handle the the processing speeds that are necessary for this type of security. No, so it's very light, so it doesn't require any additional hardware. It'll it'll run on prem on what they have. We expect it to run on a Linux blade in the enterprise. Um, so what you know, whatever cost for a Linux blade, it's not maybe ten thousand uh, dollars. The processing speed, however, we spent a lot of time and a lot of energy working on that because we wanted it to be efficient. And we were afraid because we have so much overhead on what we're doing with the data before we're putting it out to storage that we would suffer latency. And to our surprise, we found out that it's actually faster than just moving data to uh, like a native AWS. And the reason why is because we're writing out to three different places at the same time. So we have three streams going. So instead of writing to one and writing 100%, we're writing a fraction of the data to three different places at the same time. So we're thrilled to find out that it's, it's actually a little bit faster um, and we continue to work on that efficiency. Interesting. And the other question I had is with respect to pricing of the pilots. I'm a little fuzzy as to what these proceeds would be used for. Uh, it sounded like they would be used for um, onboarding some of the pilot pilot projects. Um, is there a way to price the pilots to basically fund the implementation of the pilots to avoid this round and kind of get some some success just based on the proceeds from the pilots? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. So <laughs> yeah, it'd be great. Um, so I'm not looking for us to really get rich off of the pilots, but I want the companies that we're piloting with to have skin in the game. So we're talking into the enterprise of maybe 100,000 to 250,000 for a pilot and uh, our costs and our expenses around that, we just wanna have that covered. We're trying to have that covered. Um, but we feel like we wanna get moving very quickly, right? And uh, so we're, we wanna do this round quickly and then roll right into a series A for, for expansion uh, once we're successful with the pilots. And uh, we don't wanna run out of funds as we're waiting for receivables and that sort of thing. Sure. And again, I just wanna, uh, and as a last comment, just reiterate the concerns about saying 100% breach proof and immune to ransomware. Um, 
uh, just a little leery in the space of, about that, and it may turn off some investors, um, even if you can back that up. It's kind of difficult to back it up until a hacker is able to hack it, right? So I, I would just caution, use caution when using those kind of terms because it may turn off some investors. Uh, but excellent, um, excellent presentation. Yeah, and and it has turned off some some investors. I I will agree with that. Uh, we want to be very bold with that claim. We believe that claim. Oh, I'm sorry. I've got to cut you off because we're running out of time, and we still have one more in, in, uh, judge to hear from for, for you. Christine, thank you so much. Appreciate your comments. Um, we need to hear from Jay. Your questions for Paul. Um, please keep it to two questions if possible. I'll make it easier. One question. I really like the idea, Paul. One question I have is uh, I'm very close with this, looking at the competitive set that's happening between, you know, G Cloud, Dropbox, OneDrive, and all these other, you know, online players, Box.net and everything like that. Are you worried that one of them will get into this game? Because it's a very easy thing for them to want to do where they say like, hey, your archived REST data will encrypt it and distribute it out and it's secure. Like that becomes a competitor to you very quickly. Are you worried about that type of scenario? Yeah, yeah, I'm scared to death of that. That's why I want to move at light, light speed and move very quickly. But uh, if you look at a Dropbox or G Drive, any of those, they're really focused on synchronization of data. We're looking at making data safe, right? So if you look at, for example, a ransomware attack that occurs locally on-prem, that infects immediately your iCloud, your OneDrive, your Dropbox, your Box, any of those are infected. So we're a completely different solution, but we think we would be a, a great acquisition target for one of those companies. Yeah, okay. Thank you, that was my question. Okay, great. Jay, thank you so much. Paul, thank you very much. Uh, judges, now's the time to complete your scorecards for Calamoo. Um, we are going to give you like I said, about 90 seconds, a minute and a half to two minutes um, while you do that. Um, in the interim, Eric, I think we have a, uh, another slide with some information about tech launch for the audience. Great, thank you. Um, so this is just uh, ways to contact tech launch. Um, tech launch website, there's a lot of good information on there, including a link to fill out an application. If you're in the audience now and you've got a startup company and you're thinking about um, entering the next round of pitch competitions, go to the website. There's an, an application link there um, to get in touch with, uh, with tech launch. If you are a media representative, if you're a journalist, um, please contact Norma for uh, additional information. Uh, and you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Um, we're also on LinkedIn too, I believe. Uh, so uh, look for us there. Um, that's usually where Mario and Norma post um, uh, the next round, um, other activities that are coming up and other initiatives of Tech Launch. Um, so we've had two great presentations so far. Um, again, I want to compliment the audience for great questions that you've put into the Q&A. Um, you should get ready because we've got our third and final presentation coming up um, after we have the scorecards submitted. Um, Eric, can you just give me a status update on the scorecards? Sure, just one more to go, Robin. Okay, so if great. you want, we could probably just move on and you could, we'll wait for that one to come in if you'd like. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you. Great. So next up we have Career Place. Career Place removes the bias, risk, and high costs of candidate screening. Its subscription-based screening platform combines structure and anonymity to qualify candidates, candidates fairly and efficiently. Career Place was mentored this round by Jeff Weinstein and Scott Barnett, and it's being presented by Melissa Dobbins, co-founder and CEO. Melissa, are you ready? I am. Great. All right. You can go to the first slide. Thank you. My name is Melissa Dobbins, founder and CEO of Career.Place. I'd like to introduce you to Career.Place. Our mission is to remove bias from hiring. Our value is to reduce the cost and time of talent acquisition while driving diversity and inclusion. Next slide, please. Hiring is expensive. It costs organizations between five and $25,000 per hire. 
Doing it wrong is far more expensive. Bad hires cost up to 200% of their annual salary, and that is only the beginning. Poor hiring often inhibits diversity. Not only is that detrimental for the community and the brand, it stifles revenue. Diverse teams are 33% more likely to be profitable and 158% more likely to understand, understand clients' needs. They're more creative, more flexible, and better at recognizing and navigating problems. And effective, efficient hiring that promotes diversity is now more important than ever. With high unemployment, reduced staff, and heightened diversity sensitivity, organizations will be scrambling for a solution. Career.place is that solution. It reduces the cost of hiring and the risk of hiring poorly while driving diversity. We enable organizations to hire the right talent for the right reasons at the right price. Next slide, please. Career.place is an anonymous candidate screening solution that replaces resume screens, profile reviews, initial phone and video interviews, general assessments, and other time-consuming and often biasing screening steps. Candidates flow into career.place from job boards and career, uh, job boards, career pages, recruiting efforts, and other sources. And a short list of the best qualified candidates flow out, ready for the final steps of the process. Next slide, please. Much like the TV show, The Voice, where judges must evaluate contestants sight unseen. So only their talent and not their appearance influence the results. So it is with candidates in career.place. Employers define the skills and capabilities they need for the job, and candidates apply against only those requirements anonymously. And with anonymity comes true equity, inclusion, and finding the best talent. Next slide. There are many companies with pieces of what we do, such as HireVue, Toggle, Indeed, Greenhouse, Predictive Index. But no one offers a comprehensive screening solution and no one does it anonymously. Career.place is the first candidate screening system that is designed around candidate anonymity and unbiased screening. All aspects of our technology and user experience are optimized for efficient and fair screening. We're not the first to do candidate screening. We're the first to do it correctly. In other words, we are the voice to all the others American Idol. Next slide, please. The fragmented players are drawn to talent acquisition technology for good reason. With the total available market worth billions in the US alone, there's plenty of value even during this COVID-driven downturn. Currently, we're targeting a market size of 380 million, with SMB organizations hiring between 10 and 100 people per year primarily in technology and manufacturing, as well as opportunistic enterprises. Next slide. However, as COVID has shifted the market, we have shifted with it. Career.Place is optimizing how we reach prospects to maximize our exposure to the organizations most likely investing in hiring and diversity during COVID. We've established and strengthened applicant tracking solution channel partners, including iSIMS, Greenhouse, and Jazz HR, gaining access to their nearly 60,000 customers through their marketplaces and joint marketing initiatives. We focused our direct sales efforts on segments that have more successfully weathered recent events, such as SMB technology and manufacturing. And we've expanded our marketing partnerships with associations to build relationships with enterprises it's currently investing in solutions. Next slide. Our solution works. To date, we've had 82 organizations post almost 450 jobs through our system, qualifying over 30,000 candidates. We currently have over 50,000 ARR with 14 paying customers, most of which closed during COVID, including a franchise holder with 65 retail locations. Our late stage pipeline is worth over 1.4 million ARR with 240,000 of it targeted for this for quarter um, four. Next slide. Current activities and pipeline put us in a strong position to meet our 2020 goals while gaining momentum for our 2021 growth plan. In addition to achieving our revenue goals, we are tracking to our goals of optimizing our sales cycle and building case studies and reference accounts to feed our marketing efforts. Next slide. And we've continued to progress the career.place solution to further drive our go-to-market strategy. 
Additional ATS integrations opens the door to new networks of prospects through the ATS marketplaces and partnership marketing programs. Expanded reporting will further differentiate our solution among organizations that seek oversight and actionable insight for both their DEI and ROI initiatives. And basic candidate management functionality will allow us to replace a wider range of incumbent technologies in the S&P space, increasing our, or enabling us to tap into existing budgets. Next slide. While 2020 was the year to demonstrate viability and approach, 2021 will be the year of scaling and growth. Your investment will feed this growth. The $1.5 million will fund us to our goal of 1.8 million ARR by the end of 2022 and beyond. The investment will drive growth through sales by building out a sales and business development team and amplify our messaging with the marketing communications to build and maintain channels to new prospects. Next slide. With a background in leading product and engineering for business-to-business -business technologies, we are experts at building and growing technologies, organizations, and markets. With experience after experience proving the value of strong hires and embracing diversity and inclusion, we are obsessed with ending bias and discriminatory hiring practices. So, next slide. Join us, career.place, and we will change the way hiring is done. Thank you. Melissa, great. Thank you so much. Let's now turn to the, um, and by the way, you had eight seconds left, just, <laughs> just to let you know. Um, let's turn to our audience Q&A. Um, to look, um, just, just give me a second to read some of these questions. Um, so we have one question. Have you done any follow-up studies um, to determine the, uh, to, to see if you're actually providing diverse candidates? Um, have you actually tested your hypothesis to see the results? Yes, we have. We have built in reporting that shows the diversity at every stage in our funnel. So as they go through, we can see the diversity metrics from the moment they hit the apply button to the selection. And we've definitely seen an increase in diversity. We also have a lot of great data points. So I have a whole collection of fun stories with our clients and them hiring people they never even thought to consider until they used a system like ours. Okay, great. Um, we have uh, a few questions about um, sort of how your algorithm works to eliminate bias. If you could provide a little more detail, um, how does it avoid bias by inference? For example, age-based bias. Um, <laughs> or um, other, other metrics of bias? You're gonna smile at the trick. The trick is not to use an algorithm. So rather than letting technology try to figure out what the answers are within a, within a pattern of data, which within itself can create quite a bit of bias in those pattern recognitions, we did something completely different. We turned around the process itself. So rather than looking through the patterns for people, We've just asked the candidates. So when employers specify, here's what I want, the candidates respond to that. And so there isn't that built-in bias of, well, it looks like people between the ages of 20 and 34 who are male make the best engineers. Um, I won't name the company that had that problem. But, but, but just saying, do you have experience in Java and letting the candidates respond to that, you're getting the unfiltered responses without the assumptions at all. And adding that anonymity piece, you can't overlay your biases and assumptions on top of their responses. Interesting. Um, so then can you talk about if that's your uh, approach to it, what is your competitive advantage or what's your secret sauce and how do you prevent uh, somebody else from repeating that or how do you protect that? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's no algorithms when it comes to who am I supposed to select. There are algorithms and there's a lot of secret sauce in the way that we approach the technology itself. Everything from how do you use our soft skill assessments and how does that combination of results affect if candidates are passing or not is through our algorithms. Um, as well as a lot of the details that are designed specifically to reduce the bias within the process. Things like um, allowing for not just the hard skills in a binary, but the hard skills across the spectrum. What level of hard skill do you need? Because something like a binary will actually allow more males than females to pass through. Because women will tend to self-diagnose at a lower rate than their male counterparts with the exact same skills. 
So it's all about the details. As for why other companies cannot just follow suit and copy what we're doing, they can, they absolutely can. Just like any other ATS and ATS-like technology out there, there are a lot of Me Too technologies out there and copycats. The difference is, is what the details themselves for one. So there's a lot of information and a lot of details that we spent time designing in from the ground up in order to be in order to reduce that bias. So we have so many details in there that you'd have to be pretty well versed in what's happening in order to be able to come up with them all. Two, we've got the first to market. And three, we've been at design from the very beginning for that anonymity. So most incumbent technologies have the, at their core who the candidate is. So they can get to redaction and you see that fairly common in the space, but to completely twist it upside down so that the candidate anonymity is completely sound, that's gonna take a lot of rework with a bunch of incumbent technologies. Great, thank you. Um, we have some questions about uh, the, um, your, your sales channels. Um, you mentioned a direct sales approach for the small to mid-sized businesses, um, but that's really hard to scale. Uh, mm -hmm. What's your customer acquisition cost for, for that segment? So right now, it's both relatively high and relatively low, and I'll explain. So what we did is we set up a lot of automation from the marketing and um, messaging standpoint. So things like email campaigns and social media campaigns, we set them up for a high reach knowing that the response rate is very small. So while it's not a lot of cost, you do have to do a lot of turn to grab that direct sales. It was getting, uh, it was, quite honestly, a lot more productive pre-COVID. A lot of companies have shut down um, or have gone into freeze, which is why we talked about pivoting in COVID times to focus a lot more on the channel aspect. So those that are going out and actively shopping, how do you get in front of them versus pinging out into the general business? So what we did is we focused, we doubled down on a lot of our ATS partnerships and what they have is active marketplaces where companies are shopping for solutions for things like DNI initiatives. Okay, great. And can you talk about that ATS initiative as a sales channel? Um, how successful has that been uh, mm -hmm. for you? <laughs> and, and do you have some metrics of success around that? Yeah, about half of our customers come from those channels right now. A lot of that, as I said, most of those customers came in as post-COVID. So those channels have been active post-COVID. What's been really helping that out is all of the social unrest. So the social justice movements have really pulled into the spotlight and it's cyclical and it's pulled into the spotlight, these concepts around diversity and inclusion and how important it is to have a very inclusive hiring process. A lot of the players out there in ATS, they have some pieces, they do not have a strong diversity and inclusion play. And so having that in their marketplace through us is what's gaining us some traction and a lot of attention. Okay, great. Uh, let's see, we have time for one more question. Um, uh, so the use of funds didn't include anything for research and development. How is the product being funded or improved? So we have angel investment to about 1.4 million to date. And we've been using that for all of the work that we've done up to this point. We actually have plenty more runway to go. What we're doing is ramping up using the fundings that we're talking about now in the sales and uh, marketing department. So we have a lot of that foundation already built and it's nice and strong. So what we want to focus on with this is not building the foundation, it's growth. Okay. Great. So thank you for those uh, answering those questions. Audience members, thank you for, um, again, keeping me busy trying to read all the questions. Um, let's turn now to our investor and judge panel. Um, with questions for Melissa. And I think this round, uh, Joanne, you are up first with your questions for Melissa. Um, a very we've looked into uh, work in technology for as a fund. Question is, is around the, the process. Uh, you know, I think the recruiting process head and kind of asking questions to the candidates. 
makes sense, but that involved a lot of training and maybe a service component and actually um, training the employer to, to convert their traditional job descriptions into effective uh, questions to, to recruit candidates with. I think, am I having some connectivity issues? Because I didn't quite get that question. I don't know if it's my end or not. Um, no, I think, uh, Joanne, you were breaking up a little bit. Can you repeat the question? Sure. So the question is around uh, the, the process for the employers. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Much better. Thank you. So, so are the, is there a training process for the employers to effectively convert what their traditional job descriptions look like into effective questions for candidates to answer? And is that more of a services component to your solution? Yeah, and it's a really good question. It was one of our first lessons learned, not necessarily a lesson we wanted to learn. We thought, you know, coming out into this space back in 2016, people know what they're doing and we're helping them do it better. And then we realized, nope, there's a gap. So we have pivoted um, and we do quite a bit of consulting work with our customers. But what we found is once we get them into that mindset of here are the types of questions that you ask your subject matter experts and your hiring managers, they start getting into that rhythm and very quickly take it on on themselves. So we see a little bit more upfront hold, hand holding when it comes to the conversion piece that you were talking about. And then that drops off. Um, we do monitor on our end to make sure they are finding that success and getting into that, that rhythm because we are completely dedicated to our customers' success. So do you typically see some consulting revenue at the start? What's the revenue model on the, just uh, in general? Yeah, right now we are not charging for consulting. That is something we're looking at doing for our future, but we want to reduce any barrier to entry as much as possible. And we are a technology company with a technology play. So our revenue model is based on the expected per hire or hires per year. And then it's a SaaS model. So it's a monthly amount based on how many hires they project per year on an annual cycle. Great. I know we may be running over, so I'll, I'll hand it over to Robin to, to okay. hand it to a different judge. Thank, thank you, Joanne. I think if anyone wants to uh, continue their questions of the founders offline, I'm sure they would be open to that discussion as well. Um, thanks, Joanne. Next up, we have Christine. Do you have questions for Melissa? Yeah, nice presentation. A um, couple questions I have for you. Uh, you mentioned that you're not using algorithms. Um, with respect to your special sauce, is it scalable? Uh, and I think it kind of is a continuation of the, the questions that Joanne was asking. Um, how does it scale up? Yes, it absolutely is scalable. So what it is, is it's a combination of structure through the technology. How do we bring them from point A to point B to point C in order to evaluate those candidates and then governance or what is it? What is the discipline of knowing what questions to ask, what requirements to require, um, which while we can help and we create a lot of content around that, if you look at our website and you go onto our blog, you'll see a very rich set of data that's all actionable in terms of that governance piece. We're going to have a combination of the technology and then over time overlay the consulting piece, which is really getting to know their jobs. And no technology is going to be able to solve that anyway. It's going to be able to give you patterns, but you still need the human to tell which patterns are causality or predictive and which ones are just happenstance based on what we're inheriting from a bias perspective. Like what happened with a, a large technology company back at the end of 2018 when they shut down their AI recruiting tool because it found that only men can be engineers. Pattern was there, absolutely, but it wasn't predictive. Okay. And yeah, I mean, the inherent biases and in any mm -hmm. kind of interviewing is, is really the crux of the problem. Um, exactly. One of the things you may want to focus on, and maybe you have some of those details now, is what is the retention rate for some of your current and existing customers, and also um, how much do you have in recurring revenues? Are, are the is the platform sticky? Are you keeping your customers going forward? Again, it may be a little too early for those kind of metrics, but definitely something that you want to focus on. And then the other comment I have is. <laughs> Pretty crowded space so you really should address that in your pitch a little better um, just there's there's a lot of players in this space and everyone's trying to solve this problem so just uh, a little bit 
more extensive of a competitive analysis, I think would be helpful as well. Great Thank job. Sure. Christine, great comments. Thank you. Um, Jay, you are up next with questions for Melissa. Hi, Melissa. I definitely agree that there is a challenge of bias. I mean, I, when I was on the Wharton, Wharton Admissions Committee, uh, you know, look, looking at candidates for the MBA school, I used to try not to look at their name, their gender, or like their ethnicity, because when you read their article, when you read their essays, you come away with a different sense of them versus you knowing in advance who they are or just some basic information. So I definitely believe your technology has a place that makes sense. And I wanted to follow up with a little bit uh, on what was said in the last question over here, which is uh, it's a very competitive marketplace. I, I work a lot with like looking at startups in this space. Um, I find a lot of companies nowadays want to have a more diverse workforce. Mm -hmm. They're actively recruiting for it. And I feel like your platform, and tell me if I'm wrong, would actually help them find more diverse candidates. But what more can you do to like even get even a bigger diverse? Because if you said like, hey, we're the platform that will get you candidates that have been underrepresented from the black community, from the, you know, women, for example, or underrepresented minorities. I think that would be very popular with a lot of companies, especially, you know, companies I've talked to in the state who are really big on, you know, pushing, you know, that barrier across. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And the counterpiece to that or the, the balance that is also compliance. So you need to make sure that you're finding a diverse candidate slate, but you're evaluating everyone equitably, fairly, so that you're also keeping everyone to the same standards, which is the compliance piece. And then you're also getting the best talent. So one of the things that's going to, we're going to see a big counter uh, movement against, I think in a little while, is there's a lot of companies that are taking some shortcuts at this point in a very reactionary way, but they're cutting down on their requirements in order to bring in more of that talent. So balancing all three of those things, which is exactly what we do, is that that's what's critical to not just solve the problem now, but to make it a sustaining solution, which is what we fundamentally believe in. And I think that's where the magic sauce of what you have can be because companies, if they are taking those shortcuts, which I know some of them are, and you know, it's, it's, it's a good intent for why they're doing it, but it could have legal ramifications down the road because if some candidates feel like they were not given the same opportunity or equitable uh, under employment laws, it could become a little bit of a hornet's nest for everyone. Exactly. And not only that, but if you hire incorrectly, they are being set up to fail. So what you right. end up doing is reinforcing the stereotypes and the problems that we're trying to get rid of in the first place. So you have to have the balance of all three to have a sustaining and growing solution. And that's what we've been focusing all of our energy on. Yeah, and I think that, that differentiates you pretty nicely if, if you, you show the traction there on that. Okay. Jay, great. Thank you for your questions and comments. And uh, last up, we have Jill. Your questions for Melissa. Terrific. Thanks. Great presentation and uh, definitely in need. Um, question, do you have people upload uh, their bios and resumes? No, we do have a spot where you can put your resume because a lot of companies are not willing to give it up yet. And in fact, that was one of those points where, you know, as a CEO, you have to eventually go, fine, I'll do it, but I don't want to. That's what I, my response was to allowing resumes to be uploaded at all. Um, no, it starts immediately with, do you meet the requirements of the job? Can you answer these questions in order to prove out and showcase your value to the organization? We don't use any of that data. So if we do collect data like profiles and resumes, we lock them up until the end. Okay, terrific. And then, you know, when you're doing the, um, when people are getting to the finish line, how are you ensuring the bias doesn't creep in during the interview process? That's a great question. We do not advocate hiring, um, so to speak, sight unseen, because there is that final element of who's going to resonate best with the with the organization, with the team, and you do need to reveal who that candidate is in order to get to those final pieces. So there's a couple things. One is a lot around governance. So that's where we do a lot of our training. Again, if you go to the website, you're going to see it's completely full of content. We partner with associations and do massive um, center of excellence type of training for that exact purpose. The second thing is by deferring, like what Jay had said, that voice that you sort of overlay as you're evaluating, by deferring it until the end of the process, what happens is, is you're actually putting skin in the game before you realize who that individual is. So you're less likely to be as dismissive when you are in those final stages. You're not going to have that a woman, a woman can't be an engineer because you just said that this person had an amazing code that they that you loved and you wanted to bring them in. So you've actually started to become their champion 
before you reveal who they are. And that does start counteracting that problem. So it doesn't solve it. There is still that final mile of training and governance, but it certainly helps and puts us in a much better position than where we were. And are you thinking about how you're going to monetize all that additional time that you're putting in? Yes. So there's a couple of things that we're doing. Those partnerships that we're working on will eventually become monetized partnerships through training programs and things like that and building out that um, consultative branch like what we were talking about. But right now we're focusing on bringing in that technology revenue, that, that um, recurring revenue. So we don't want to do too much to shake that. So we've been doing basically loss leader con uh, content. We will want to transition that into revenue generating at some point. Great. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jill, thank you for your comments. Melissa, thank you so much for presenting. Um, at this point, we now have, um, we'd like to ask the panel, please complete the scorecards for Career Place. And uh, for the audience, I uh, just wanted to go over some of the um, impressive stats to date for Tech Launch. Um, the Tech Launch name is synonymous with New Jersey entrepreneurship and to date has served nearly 100 tech focused companies. Uh, the group as a whole has mentored over 200 aspiring entrepreneurs and launched 26 tech, tech ventures with seed capital. And since 2017 has held 18 bullpen pitch events like this one, uh, catering to 50 seed stage companies. Um, so if you are an entrepreneur in the audience and you are um, considering pitching, please uh, check out again, look at the website, uh, look for more information uh, about how to apply, how to get your application in and how to start that process. Um, there are also weekly office hours with the senior mentors. Um, so check out those as well. Look for uh, social media announcements about when that uh, when that occurs. Um, so we will give our investor panel and judge panel um, a few more uh, minutes to um, complete their scorecards. And um, presenters, I just wanna remind you to stick around, uh, do not hang up at the end of the, at the, end of the call uh, because there will be the traditional tech launch group photo at the end. And as a reminder, um, the winner of uh, the declared winner for, of today will receive an invitation to pitch in front of Jumpstart and Tech Council Ventures, and will also be uh, entitled to receive $15,000 of in kind services from our event partners Witham, Gearheart Law, Casabona Ventures, and Gibbons Law. And our winner is Calamoo. Congratulations, Paul and Calamoo. And again, thank you very much to, uh, to Shri and to Melissa for presenting today. I think everyone was fantastic. Um, really great effort by everyone involved. Yep, so again, congratulations to Kalamu. Paul, you uh, did a fantastic job. Uh, Robin already uh, thanked. Uh, what I wanna do is thank uh, Robin, Robin Baer for her uh, uh, um, attention to this. She did a fantastic job as well as Eric Korb as the webinar producer. Um, and I'll repeat, thank you to our panelists, Christine, Jill, Jay, and, and Joan. There's a lot of J's there, so that's a good thing. Thank you to the event partners, uh, Witham, Gibbons, Casabona Ventures, Gerhardt Law, uh, Jumpstart New Jersey Angel Network, and Tech Council Ventures. And finally, to the audience, thank you for attending and participating, especially in the Q&A. Um, please keep healthy and safe to the next bullpen event. Uh, applications, I wanna remind uh, the entrepreneurs, applications for our next business accelerator program, which culminates in the bullpen, will be announced soon. And check out our website, techlaunch.com, for the various mentors, advisors, and senior mentors that we have. Thank you very much and really appreciate your time participating in the event.